Welcome to my unofficial screencast debuting the Sickle 1.2 OpenCL standard released by Kronos. This unofficial video is going to give you a high-level overview of what Sickle is about, the role that it has within the OpenCL ecosystem, just a little bit of motivation about that, and generally what is Sickle and should you read the specification. So this is the intention of this is just to give you a very quick idea to convey what I've read from the specification to you as developers and to really encourage you to check it out and see what you think and to provide feedback on it as this is a provisional specification. So to outline my objectives a little bit more concretely, this is what I'm going to talk about in the video right now. What's OpenCL? Why does it matter? And what's the value of OpenCL to you? If you haven't heard about OpenCL before, I want to give you a little bit of insight. If you have heard of it, this discussion is going to be very brief. So please bear with me for a moment as I complete it. What is OpenCL middleware and why do we need something like that? And this motivates the purpose of something like Sickle within the ecosystem. What is Sickle itself? And I want to give you an overview of the specification. This is really trying to motivate you to read the specification for yourself and come to your own conclusions. I'm only giving you a little bit of guidance as to how to tackle the specification with a little bit of insight. I'm intentionally light on sample code at this point because I want to give you an idea of what everything's about and not get you lost in details and show you extreme amounts of code which we can review later. That's why this is a high level overview and not a detailed training session. I also am going to provide a software engineering discussion. What are the advantages and disadvantages of Sickle as I see it right now? There's no good evidence for having a discussion either way at this point because there are no applications out there that are using Sickle. We haven't tried a lot of things yet with it, so I really don't know. But I'm going to provide you with a little bit of insight as to what I think. And you can take it or leave it and provide a little bit of motivation. So what about myself? Who am I? Well, I'm a C++ and OpenCL expert. I'm now an OpenCL Standards Committee member. I will reference once again that this video is unofficial and is not endorsed by Kronos in any way, shape, or form. These are my own opinions from reading the standard, uh, the SQL standard which was released. I'm a software engineer and computer scientist. I view computer science as a mathematical discipline focused on algorithm design and theoretical aspects of computation. And the software engineer in me looks at how to actually complete a large-scale software project relying upon that. I've produced several professional OpenCL training videos that I've released on YouTube. You can go ahead and check out these other links and uh, let me know what you think of it. I'm currently planning a paid workshop on OpenCL software engineering, which is going to really get into details as to how to leverage OpenCL in a professional project. You can certainly follow my blog or get more information about that by subscribing to my Twitter account or by subscribing to my videos because I will release an announcement when I'm prepared to do a paid workshop. I'm available as a consultant for Nogenius Computing Project, so if you want to bring me in and just get a little bit of help and guidance based on my experience, I'm more than happy to help you out. And please check out my website. This is my personal website, www.ajguion.com. Please give me uh, some feedback or let me know if you have any questions or concerns about anything related to the various OpenCL standards which I can forward on your behalf, or alternatively, just drop in and let me know what you think of my training. So this is the pitch about OpenCL. Why should you care as an application developer about OpenCL? So to answer this, we need to understand what heterogeneous computing is. So let's draw a line in the sand here and discuss what computing used to be like before heterogeneous computing. And of course, it was homogeneous computing. So this is the hardware perspective. Homogeneous hardware has this notion that you have a single CPU device, multiple cores potentially on that device today, but they're all running the same instructions. They're all, you know, the, the cores are from the same vendor. You don't have an AMD and Intel core on the same CPU that I'm aware of. That's what homogeneous hardware is all about. And heterogeneous computing flips that around. So instead, we have a host, which you see on this bar here, which defines a number of devices. Each device has compute units inside of it, which are analogous to a core, and each device has its own RAM. Now, each of these devices could be produced from different vendors. You could have an AMD device, an Intel device, an NVIDIA device, an Altera device. It doesn't matter. This, this greatly increases the complexity of programming, but ultimately delivers a lot of value to you as an application programmer. 
So let's look at the software stack. What does this actually look like for you? Again, let's divide a line in the sand here, and let's look at homogeneous software. How did things work before? You would write your application. The application would make any calls affecting the hardware through the operating system at some level, and it would the operating system would be responsible for dispatching to the actual hardware, which previously consisted of CPU and RAM connected together. This is what we all know, and this is how applications have been designed before the advent of heterogeneous computing. Today, with heterogeneous computing, things look a little bit different. You have your application, which still makes calls to the operating system. You still have a CPU there, but you also, you also have OpenCL. And OpenCL allows you to tap into this pool of hardware devices that you can decide which device to use for which purpose. This provides a little bit of a bypass from the operating system. OpenCL is likely in the Im implementation still going to be making OS calls. But from your application's perspective, OpenCL is there to manage the hardware for you. You need to learn a little bit more detail to understand how this all works. This is the pitch, but why should you care? What's the value of OpenCL to you? Well, your application can use all available resources for computation. So, for example, you might offload image processing to a GPU, and you might use the CPU for low latency task. So you as a developer are actually able to decide where you want to place function calls and how you want things to proceed. This adds a significant amount of programming complexity, and that is something that is being addressed with better tools and better um, compilers, better technology, and that's the role we have as software developers, is to figure out how to do a better job of abstracting this. Customers can take your OpenCL-enabled application and develop a workstation that is specific to run your application. So you can publish minimum application device requirements. So you can say if you have one CPU, this application will work. It'll work fairly well. But if you have a CPU and three GPUs, this application is going to be very fast. And your customers can select hardware to provide the experience that they actually want. So if you're developing, say, an optimization package, and your, your customers decide that optimization takes quite a bit of the develop quite a bit of the runtime, uh, they can select hardware that matches with that optimization package to accelerate it. This is what OpenCL is all about. OpenCL ultimately makes you more competitive. You're able to be faster than your competitors. You're able to use OpenCL for market advantage. You have a major advantage as a young company that if you use OpenCL, you can go ahead and start targeting hardware that your competitors just can't target at this point. You also have an advantage that as a startup company, you probably don't have legacy code. If you're developing something from the start, you might as well go ahead and use OpenCL and get all of the advantages and let your competitors have to worry about migration of previous software. There are many OpenCL implementations available. These images are taken from the Kronos website list of implementers of the OpenCL standard. You can download OpenCL implementations from these vendors. There is widespread industry support for OpenCL in the hardware community and the software community. We're coming in right behind with new tools and that's part of what Sickle is about. So how do you learn OpenCL? If this is the first time you've heard of it, you're interested, you just heard the pitch about it, what do you do and where do you go to find more information? The first thing you can do is click the link in the video description for professional training that I offer to you. If you want to financially support this work, it will help me produce videos a little bit faster. I do this in my free time as something that I'm just interested in teaching you what OpenCL is all about. There's many paid workshops that you can go ahead and attend from various companies. Kronos often lists on its website, uh, as well as uh, AMD. I have seen that they will list in their newsletter uh, workshops that are coming up. You might want to attend one, take a look at what's going to be discussed in the workshop, see if this is something that's interesting to you. There are some books out there in OpenCL, and you can read the raw OpenCL specifications from Kronos. There are several specifications. OpenCL has many versions. The specification is fairly approachable, but you may wish to read uh, a little bit of uh, a tutorial, or you may wish to watch some of the other videos to give you the right mindset when you read the specification. The specification is the ultimate resource, of course. Everything else can just guide you to understand what's in that specification. You can also hire me to train your company or group. I love talking about OpenCL. If you're interested, you can give me a call or send me a, an email, and 
maybe if you're interested I can come and just show you how to use this. Alternatively, if you're trying to get into the market really quickly, you might just want to hire a consultant to help you out. There are many consultants out there that help you with put OpenCL into your applications who have the experience and knowledge that you need to rapidly do this. I do this myself as well, but there are lots of people out there. There's an entire community growing around OpenCL to help you get into that market. So what's the motivation for Sickle? What's the point? Why do we need something like that? Is not the OpenCL standard good enough? Well, let's look at the OpenCL specification really quickly. The OpenCL specification has several versions. There's 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, and 2.0, which have now been released, and you can download and take a look at what's inside of them. Every version of the OpenCL specification defines how applications interact with devices, and devices have memory and can execute functions. The functions you have available to you vary a little bit from version to version of the standard. Okay, so, but that being aside, we'll get into that something for another video uh, to discuss how that relates to you, but each version basically describes uh, the interaction. Devices implement functions provided with OpenCL C. So you actually have a C language which is restricted. It's a subset of C99 which allows you to program these heterogeneous devices. There are alternatives to OpenCL C that can be provided now with Spear, which is another standard. And this is something to, to bear in mind because not everyone likes to work in C as a language and Spear is an opportunity for you to develop your own languages that might do a better job of expressing what heterogeneous computing is all about. As I said, the hardware is there. Our job as software developers is really to figure out the abstractions that we should have for heterogeneous computing and how to use it inside of industrial strength applications. That's what we're still figuring out. The OpenCL specification is rather low level. You're not going to be productive using it directly. You can, but you will not feel productive. There are so many other tools that we know of, like sockets, threads, that are low-level components that have to be there, but you're not going to be productive using them directly. And OpenCL is an example of such a thing. I prefer to use higher-level concepts that map to OpenCL. And you can use OpenCL, but as a developer, I prefer abstractions. So the abstractions... I use the term middleware. Other people will use other terms. When I think of abstractions for OpenCL, I think of OpenCL, this is the specification or the implementation, the actual thing that's driving these devices as being the lowest level of a stack here. The application is the highest level. I think of middleware as something in between. So the application doesn't directly manage OpenCL, it uses something else to help deal with the complexity of OpenCL and the low-level details that must be handled. But you probably don't want to deal with them in every single application you write because you will feel a loss of productivity. Your application will also use libraries, which likely have been developed using the middleware. So this is my definition of middleware. Other people will have different definitions. So for the, this conversation, this is what middleware is all about. It's a layer of abstraction that helps you out manages the OpenCL complexities for you, and allows you to be productive as an application developer. So what are the general objectives of any middleware? The number one objective is to reduce the complexity of OpenCL management. This is something that's imposed upon us for various design reasons, but as if you're just trying to ship an application as a developer, you really don't want to think about it. The other objective of middleware is to provide different abstractions than standard OpenCL. So you might be able to eliminate a good amount of complexity of dealing with a standard without sacrificing, without sacrificing performance. That's what the whole point of middleware is, is I can provide you with an abstraction which has an efficient mapping to standard OpenCL, but actually is really nice as a developer to think this way, right? We, we, there's so many there is so much evidence of doing this before. It's just another example of it. And the other general objective of good middleware should be to enable good software engineering. No one wants to do something that is very low level um, these days. We want to have really good software engineering practices, and we need to have a little bit of a layer between the application and the raw OpenCL standard to allow that. It doesn't have to be there, but it certainly will be easier if it's there for you. The ultimate goal also of general 
uh, of middleware in general, is to reduce the time to market for developers. If you reduce the complexity of the project, you actually are overall more productive. You can have more features. You can deliver more value to your own customers. And that should be a major objective of middleware is to, to really free up your time by taking care of the nitty-gritty details so that you don't have to think about it. The other objective for middleware is to really enable the development of reusable libraries. It can be rather complicated to, to develop a reusable library in OpenCL for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to bother getting into. But the whole point of middleware is maybe it can help us out by providing something that reusable libraries can, uh, can exist through the middleware. So now is the uh, debut of Sickle. This is actually what you want to see. So what is Sickle exactly? Well, using my definition of OpenCL middleware, it's middleware for developers. It relies upon OpenCL at the lowest end of the stack of abstraction, and it's there for you to use to create libraries or to create applications, just as I outlined for the motivation of middleware. The ultimate goal of Sickle is to make OpenCL nicer for C++ development. Sickle enables single source C++ program development. You don't have to use a single source. There is an alternative to do multiple compilation. You get into that briefly in this video. But the general idea is that you can take a single C++ source file, which mixes host and device code, and you can use it to create your C++ application. The device source code is compiled offline. So this is contrasting it with the OpenCL standard where you have a so-called online compiler. You can actually call a compilation function at runtime. Uh, with Sickle, this has to be done at compilation time because uh, you actually can do things like template instantiations or lambda captures inside of Sickle, which it has to actually know how the host is calling the device code to work. So this is a slight difference between the OpenCL standard that, the, that this is an offline compilation stage. More about that later. Sickle provides a number of OpenCL management features. Sickle really attempts to simplify OpenCL device management for you. Whether or not this attempt has been successful, I'm going to leave to you to decide whether or not you think that this is the abstraction that you need to actually do your work. Simplification is different for everyone. It's up to you to decide if this is right for you. This is a provisional chrono standard. So there's an opportunity right now for you to provide feedback on things that are ambiguous in the standard to you, things you would like the standard to say, and you can submit it to a forum on the Kronos website and it will be taken into account to consider whether or not the SQL standard should be adjusted based on what you have to say. So I really encourage you to take a look at the standard, see what you have to say, let us know, and the Kronos uh, SQL Standards Committee can, can see if, if your feedback can be incorporated and make this an even better standard for you. Sickle is specific to OpenCL 1.2. Something to note, there are multiple OpenCL standards available. for that. It's like that for various reasons, but uh, it is specific to 1.2 at the moment. So what do you get if you use Sickle? Well, you can actually start to use some C++ language features. This is something that I have wanted for a very long time. You can actually start to use kernels with C++ language features. This means that you can write templates and you can use classes and it will be compiled on the device for you. But not all C++ features are available to you. You're not going to get polymorphism. You're not going to get function pointers. You're not going to get new and delete. Part of the reason for that is that Sickle is not really uh, changing what the OpenCL standard says. The OpenCL standard does not permit these things. Sickle is a convenience thing for you. It's going to help you write C++ code. It's going to help you by extracting your logic and generating the device code, but it can't suddenly change what you can and cannot do in the specification. And at this time, polymorphism, function pointers, new delete, and a number of other features are simply forbidden due to hardware limitations. Sickle gives you an opportunity to really simplify the integration of host and device code. This has been a major complaint against OpenCL, and this begins to offer you an opportunity to do type-safe work where the host and device are cooperating. But bear in mind, there still is a barrier between host and device. This is not the place to get into the technical details for what that barrier is, but conceptually, 
The host is what runs your C++ program. The device is something else that's attached that may not be sophisticated enough to run C++, which requires uh, quite a bit of hardware or other concepts. You know, C++ requires potentially, say, an operating system, stuff like this, uh, that is not defined on the device. The device may just be a simple accelerator and FPGA. So there's still this barrier, but it's really trying to reduce the complexity of that barrier to make your life easier. Another example of something that would be nice but you can't do because there is that barrier is you can't throw exceptions, for instance, from a device to host. SQL also includes C++ classes that represent OpenCL concepts. You can use these classes to build your own abstractions. So there's a number of features that you want as a C++ developer that are bundled in here for you. Now, what's the programming model? How do we actually program using SQL? What does it look like? Well, let's take a look at the OpenCL kernel execution model. This is foreign for you. Go ahead and look at some of the other training material online. But if you're new to Open, or, sorry, if you're used to OpenCL, this will make perfect sense to you. So let's go ahead and look at how a kernel executes. So to execute the kernel foo, we go ahead and decompose our problem into a number of work groups. Each work group is then pulled out and further decomposed into a number of work items. Each of these work items is processed individually through the kernel function. Uh, this is basically how you do things in OpenCLC. Now, SQL uh, integrates with this execution model. So your device code is actually contained within C++ functor objects. You have to override the operator parentheses, and you can use C++ lambdas. So this is the basic way of programming it, is that you just imagine that you have C++ functor objects, and... Uh, the SQL compiler will take care of that, which I'll go over in a little bit. Kernel functors take a work item ID as an argument. So conceptually, conceptually, the operator parentheses is invoked per white work item. Now it's likely going to be invoked in parallel based on your hardware, and it's going to likely do a compilation phase to do it very efficiently. But for you as a developer, you can imagine that this operator parentheses is being applied per work item. Okay. Kernels are actually invoked using templates. So SQL comes with parallel 4, single task, and parallel 4 workgroup, which are methods of invoking these, uh, these kernel functors. So let's look at a very quick code example. Uh, this is going to execute for a global work size of 1,000 uh, things, this example kernel functor. This is basically how it looks. This is a much nicer way of doing OpenCL development than we've seen so far. Uh, the way it does this is based on a few different tricks um, that you'll see in the compilation phase. But this is this is a nice way at this point to program uh, devices. Whether or not it's the best way, up to you. And I will mention some of the advantages and disadvantages. Remember that there are OpenCL commands. So the way that OpenCL actually works is that the host directs OpenCL devices via synchronous commands. You have to tell the device what to do, and the only way to tell it what to do is by issuing it commands, those CL and Q commands uh, that you've seen in the standard. SQL provides the command group, and the command group is a class which allows you to create a collection of memory and kernel execution commands and bundle them together. That group is going to be scheduled atomically on a device. So this is how it starts to fit in. SQL starts to fit in with how commands uh, are dispatched to actual devices. The general idea is to bundle the kernel with memory commands required to run it so that you can just go ahead and dispatch it. It's trying to eliminate some of the complexity of OpenCL memory movement for you. SQL provides a queue class analogous to the CL command queue. In fact, uh, my understanding of the specifications is it's simply a wrapper. And the queue class waits for all commands to complete in its destructor. So there's a little bit of an effort here within SQL to help you reduce the complexity of running commands and managing the OpenCL devices uh, at, a, at a higher level and using C++ abstractions. So how does compilation work? This is an important topic and one of the key things you should keep in mind when you're reading the specification. SQL supports single source compilation as one of the options available to you. So you're going to create this combined C++ source file, just a regular C++ file, which has inside of it 
your host C++, so this is ordinary C++ you're used to, maybe it's coming from an existing project, and you have the C++ kernel functor objects which have been sprinkled in, and this is what Sickle understands how to execute on devices. You're going to pass that to a single source compiler provided by Sickle, uh, a Sickle conformant implementation, and that compiler is going to separate things out, and it's going to separate the host code and the device code. Uh, this is done by the compiler transparently to you. You just went ahead and did your uh, work, and it's going to generate link together your application binary that you can go ahead and just invoke. Now, I'll note here that one of the objectives of Sickle is to not require extensions to the C++ language. However, you do need to have some sort of compilation phase that can take those kernel functors and sift them out to actually generate the device code. So let's take a look at another opportunity for compilation. Let's take a look at separate compilation. How would that look? Once again, we have host C++ code. It's a C++ code you're used to. But let's say you don't want to taint your project with the functors required by Sickle to work. Another option for separate compilation and integration in existing projects where you want to have a very clean separation uh, between Sickle and your, your current project is you can go ahead and pass these kernel functors through a device compiler. That will generate a glue header which contains the device code and you can go ahead and just include that header and use it with any C++ compiler uh, that you normally use. And this basically prevents anything that is Sickle specific from contaminating your project. There are some things you have to do that are a little bit uh, potentially odd compared to normal C++ programming, um, and that's what the intention here is. Now this is my understanding from reading the specification. This particular diagram may not be accurate, but I'm fairly confident that it is based on reading the relevant sections of the spec. Ultimately, the glue header, the host C++ code is going to get compiled, linked together, and generate an application binary. So this is just an option for you to have some power as a developer to figure out what you want to do. So here's some general notes on compilation. Sickle requires a special compilation phase to work. You can't just implement it using expression templates or something else. So unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends upon your point of view, uh, you do need a something that can sift out those kernel functors and compile it, because it has to be compiled offline. C++ language extensions are not required. I mentioned this. Uh, some non-standard features are provided to you, but you really shouldn't use them. So despite their existence, it is clear in the specification that you probably don't want to use these, but they're provided for you anyways. It's very important to me as a developer that I don't need to extend the C++ language with anything, and Sickle does not require such an extension. Ordinary C++ compilers should just work. Uh, Sickle is just standard C++. So if you use the multiple compilation uh, method, it should just go ahead and work. Sickle compiler is always going to be required to generate the device code. An ordinary C++ compiler does not know how to target an OpenCL device, so you do need this specialized compiler to work. I'm going to quickly talk about software engineering. So what are the positives and negatives about Sickle from your perspective as an application developer? Well, the advantage is, first advantage, is you can go ahead and generate device binaries from your C++ code. This means you can use templates and un other nice C++ features within your kernel functors. This is really nice for me that I can go ahead and start using C++. I'll feel a lot more productive. Sickle provides C++ interfaces for OpenCL concepts, so you don't really have to mess with the C API. It really attempts to simplify programming it is easier to write OpenCL code using Sickle. There is a potential for library creation here, so you might be able to write reusable C++ libraries with Sickle. The only reason I'm stressing the might is because I haven't tried it myself. I'm not going to tell you that you can do it when I haven't tried to do it and found all of the potential issues that we're inevitably going to discover when you actually take a specification and try to apply it to real-life projects. Real-life projects, as we all know, are rather nasty things, and sometimes things look like they're going to work really well, and they don't. So Sickle was designed so that you can create these reusable libraries, but I'm not sure how well it's going to fulfill that, only due to lack of experience. 
there's some disadvantages. I'll just list these all here because of that mistake. Oops. Um, the sickle compiler is required to generate device code. So you do need a compiler to do this. It's not an inherently bad thing, but uh, I would rather it wasn't necessary. Sickle also only supports OpenCL 1.1. So there's OpenCL 1.0, 1.1, 1.2 devices in the wild, and now 2.0 is out. So it's a disadvantage from my point of view that Sickle only supports OpenCL 1.2 because NVIDIA is still on OpenCL 1.1 so far as I can tell. What this means is that Sickle software isn't necessarily going to run uh, on the other devices, on older devices that are out there. So this is something that you need to take into consideration yourself, is that there is a slight limitation that it's supporting OpenCL 1.2. Now, to be fair, at some point you have to decide a version of the specification you support, and Sickle decided to support OpenCL 1.2. There's no good or bad thing about that. It's just a decision that has to be made. It's not entirely clear to me how well Sickle is going to work on a large project. We need to take Sickle, we need to try it out, and see how well it actually works. It's really hard to say how things are going to pan out before you actually try them. Sickle is a provisional specification, so you have an opportunity to provide feedback. I strongly encourage you to read the specification, provide your feedback on the relevant forum. There's a link to it in this video. And uh, you know what? Just Try it out, see what you think, give your opinions. If you find problems, you should certainly highlight them. If you think that there's a philosophical issue that you don't quite like this or that about the standard, this is really the best time to start putting it forward and have it considered by the right people at Kronos. Thank you for your time. Apologize for a couple of stumbles here in recording this video at the last moment. And please feel free to subscribe to my Twitter, look at the other videos I have available, and... Uh, Thank you for taking a look, and I hope that you enjoy Sickle.